The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. I am founder and CEO of Turcona, and I will uh, talk to you today about the uh, optimizing MySQL configuration. So we'll talk about the uh, basic things. Okay, well, if you will be for me, then we'll talk about a uh, few things, uh, such as approach to uh, getting decent MySQL configuration, MySQL configuration uh, options, different tools to configure MySQL, and then we spend the most amount of time looking at the most uh, important MySQL options. Now, let me ask you, if you guys are responsible for tuning MySQL, how, frequent, how many options do you have in the MySQL config file? Anybody has more than 50? More than 20? 10? OK. Yeah, fair enough. Anybody runs if default MySQL configuration? Okay. And how useful do you think a default MySQL configuration is? Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, it, it does well for running your home DVD collection. Well, let's think about this, right? When you have a, a content in the MySQL buffer pool, right? We access, we have a page miss, we have to read the page from memory. Now imagine what we have the large buffer pool instead, and we try to access the page, it was removed from a memory right by the kernel, and we have a page fault and it's been brought back from, uh, from a swap space. In both cases, we are speaking about just one IO operation, right? What is wrong with this logic? Anybody can tell me? No? Well, the thing here is that the databases are designed with, uh, with very much thinking put into what stuff is in memory and what is on disk. Completely different algorithms are employed. In particular, databases know they should not hold any important logs while doing the I.O., right? Because I.O. can take a lot of time and the databases typically operate in highly concurrent environments, so there is a lot of queries and tasks are going on at the same time, right? If you have swapping going on, then, in, uh, then database will often be found holding the logs while doing the I.O., right? Which often would essentially stall database completely and, uh, and restrict other threads which have their content in the buffer pool from processing. That is why even the relatively modest amount of swapping can really hurt database performance. Make sense? Now, let me talk a little bit about the uh, MySQL automated uh, uh, configuration tuning. And I would split the tools which exist uh, out there in the, into kind of a three different groups. One, which I would say is the uh, configuration tuning tools. You can find a number of those in the, uh, in the internet which say, hey, well, run this tool and it will give you advice about your MySQL configuration, how to change and fix it. The other tools, we, I, would, I would call advisory tools, will check your configuration file for typical errors and omissions, right? Providing more like advice to what to look into than exact uh, magic best uh, variables. And then the third one uh, would be something like a template or tools which, pro uh, which provide you an easy way to create a basic configuration to, uh, to get going. Right. The problem with the configuration tools for the first time is, the first type is really what they are uh, trying to take a complex decision while looking at relatively small uh, amount of information, such as status variables, right, or maybe database size. And that makes them dangerous in a the sense they can often provide very reasonable advice and get you off uh, guard when uh, they fi you finally follow the advice with uh, uh, results which are not so well. And as an example, I took the 
MySQL Tuner script which I run on uh, one of the servers and I want just to go over here what it prints out and why some recommendations are good and some are bad which I found for the interesting exercise. So if you look from the start it prints out a lot of basic uh, information, right? So we can see uh, current uh, information about the current version of a MySQL, information about operating environment like 64-bit operation system, storage engines, and so on and so forth. Then we come to this uh, stuff I marked in red. Oh my gosh, you have 110 fragmented tables. I can tell you, I just run my optimized table five minutes before running the script. What? could be wrong. Why does it tell me about 110 optimized, uh, 110 fragmented tables? Anybody knows? Well, because this tool assumes my sum. In my sum, fragmented table, or we tell that fragmented table when there is some free space, right, as reported. In InnoDB, in majority of cases, there is going to be free space. Right? Even after optimize, you're quite likely to have some free space which does not correspond to fragmented tables. Right? So uh, in this case, that can be, well, mm, uh, rather wrong. What are other interesting mm, things here? We can see performance metrics. A lot of, uh, a lot of interesting, uh, uh, interesting stuff here. One of the things I would say, uh, a lot of tools and mentions on the internet you'll find is about the reads and writes. In a lot of cases, what you will look at and say, oh, how many selects you have compared to updates. In a lot of cases, that is not really meaningful because uh, way too much depends on the complexity of the queries, right? I mean, often you would find a database which you would see, oh, is 90% writes while all your writes are essentially single row inserts, while all your reads are very expensive reporting queries, right? And that's, uh, so you can't really measure that by the, uh, uh, by the queries if you want the uh, meaningful uh, standpoint. Okay. Another thing what I think the, the tools also would say is something like maximum possible memory usage. Do you guys know what is wrong with this? So in this case, what tool does is looks at my total number of buffers plus a certain number of threads by 2.7 megabytes per thread, right? Which is, looks uh, as a sum of per thread buffers. And then adding this up together, we get uh, 4.8 gigs. Come on, guys. Wake up. It's so, oh, it's past 10 o'clock already. We will be a little bit more active. So what is wrong with 4.8 gigs? Huh? No, why 4.8 gigs is wrong, right? That is, or I would say it's not even wrong, it's meaningless, right? Well, the thing here is what a lot of buffers which are specified here, MySQL do not really always allocate them. For example, MySQL would allocate sort buffer size only when it needs to do the sort, right? So in, in a lot of cases that is not a representative for uh, of what your workload will actually require. But the second important thing here is what those numbers are also, uh, it's not the upper limit either, because running store procedures or complicated queries of subselects, I can have multiple temporary tables, multiple stored buffers, unlimited amount of memory allocated as stored procedures variables allocated per thread. So that is really absolutely meaningless. What would be a better way to see uh, how much, uh, where we are tuning MySQL server properly? I would argue that the best way is actually to look uh, at the value, right? You can look at the VCZ, the like virtual size memory in the PS output at the top. Often you can graph this value and see how it changes over time. So you can understand how much memory MySQL uses in your workload. And if you have too much free memory, you can increase that. If it get, goes too large, well, you can adjust certain buffers appropriately. That's a lot more meaningful. Okay, slow queries. 
Anybody knows how do we get to 7% of a slow queries? Hmm? Yeah, well, uh, that's right. So what MySQL looks at here is the queries which are longer than amount of certain amount of time. In our practice, in very many cases, we would temporarily enable full slow query log file, right, to get the all queries logged, right, so we'll send, uh, set long query time to zero, get the log of all the queries, right, and that is where a lot of monitoring systems starts to scream. Oh my gosh, you have 100% of the slow queries, somebody must be dying, right, well, not exactly. It's just uh, well, uh, the question of how MySQL interprets those. Right? It's, uh, uh, a lot of, I've seen a lot of people being, uh, being surprised by, uh, by that one. Okay. A lot, the next thing I would point out is this one. Query cache is disabled. Should we just always go ahead and enable query cache? Well, query cache is evil, right? I mean, it, it does for, uh, s uh, the, for small installations, right? Especially if you don't have any other cache, like memcache support by the uh, application you're running. But it doesn't really scale. The query cache was written in the time where two CPUs or two cores was as much as you would get into expensive commodity hardware, right? And it stayed there from its design uh, applications. It doesn't really scale with multi-cores. It also has, doesn't really scale with uh, query cache uh, sizes. You have to be very careful setting query cache to large amounts. Okay. Another thing uh, I would like to point out here is a table cache. Uh, hit rate. Right. So one of the things uh, here I'm is a little bit concerned is like how table cache hit rate is mentioned as number of open tables decided by uh, which is essentially table cache size decide, divided by table opened. But that is not in the main point here, right? Even if you uh, compute the miss rate correctly, not all misses are avoidable in the first place, right? So, a table cache uh, is a structure, if you know, which keeps their uh, information about the open tables. If MySQL is to access the table, it will check the table cache first, and if not, the miss will happen, it will go and open the table. Right? Now, in a lot of cases, you indeed want uh, that to happen rarely as possible, but it's not avoidable in all cases. Can anybody tell me in which case I can't avoid a table cache miss? Well, then I'm creating the table, right? In a, in a number of workloads, when you create and drop a lot of tables, you'll have a lot of table cache misses because I create a table, it's created on disk, when I'm going to open that table, there will be table cache miss because that newly created table cannot be in the cache, right? So I've seen people, again, chasing their table cache size to very, very, very high values, well, uh, because of this. Okay, let me uh, move on. And then you can see also some other stuff uh, here in terms of recommendations. A run optimized table, well, we already did that. And then uh, it tells us to increase the table cache size, which is already on, of a uh, uh, decent memory. And we can see a um, uh, bunch of uh, other recommendations, which uh, some of them which we discussed may not be uh, uh, really needed. Another tool I would mention, which, this is a tool from uh, a Percona Toolkit, a set of tools for uh, DBAs. And what we try to uh, create, at large extent by our own kind of uh, uh, consultants use is to have something like uh, lint tools, right? Or something which would do some static checking to check configuration files for a number of known conditions which we may want to pay attention to. 
We don't apply in this case what you want to, to follow every single advice because a lot of systems are a lot more complicated than tool can uh, advise us. For example, it tells us, hey, well, in a D flash logo TRX commit is not set to one, which is, means it's not fully ACID. It may or may not be a problem for you. If you are running the bank application powered by MySQL, that's probably is a problem. If you just migrate it off uh, MySum, right, or having something like store non-critical data on the underpowered server, right, with slow disks, that may not be a problem for you, right? And you can see in a lot of the other uh, of, uh, advice as well, right, it would print us uh, different kinds of warnings, like, oh, uh, using the old uh, passwords, which is insecure, right? Do you really understand that? Maybe you are using so old client that's required, or maybe you uh, just get a system and security risk. The next uh, is, uh, tool that I would mention is uh, we have created the My, uh, MySQL configuration advisor. And frankly, I will be honest with you, we thought initially about the creating the tool, how we can really tune MySQL configuration so you would get both a uh, set of your variables, right, your maybe database size, your status counters, and that will do some magic and create the tools. But now, as we go through that, uh, it essentially, in a way, uh, trying to compare the configuration that we're able to get from the tools compared to what consultants would generate, we found there are so much different conditions, but that is not really possible. There are just so many cases which uh, you cannot grasp from getting just variables and status counters. You have to really spend significant time looking at a database. So we could get a tool which would give you right advice and maybe 90%, but we thought, but damaging advice in another 10, which we thought that wasn't good enough. So instead, we converted that to a tool which creates your sort of basic configuration template, which often will get you going, right, which you can ad adjust for your own needs very quickly. So it will just ask you some sort of questions like hardware, number of CPUs, memory, and then we'll get you the uh, configuration file, right, which would specify a lot of uh, the most meaningful options which you, we expect you to go over and adjust to your conditions because you know your system. We don't. But I can tell you this uh, stuff can often uh, get you started and we uh, we ourselves use number of templates a lot. Okay, so for the next half an hour, we'll have a very boring part of presentation and I will go over about probably 50 different configuration options and try to explain you what they mean. So, unless you're bored to death in the end, I didn't do my job well. Before we get to variables though, uh, we should look at the status uh, counters because I will refer to them a lot. What are the status counters of MySQL? Well, since the very early days of MySQL, it has number of status counters which are basically incremented when different events uh, would happen, right? Uh, and you can get them by running show global status and uh, looking at the output. Now, that is one way to look at them, which will give you values from start. In a lot of cases, you, what you want to understand is information about their values kind of per second and uh, how they grow. In a lot of cases, we also want to look at the multiple samples because in many cases, you may be running some specific query in that very moment when you took the sample, which can be very much outlier compared to your normal workload. To do that, we have created this very simple uh, maxed tool. What it does, it essentially runs MySQL admin few times and tabulates the values. Right? So we can see these are values which are since startup, and in some cases we want to see that. And these are number of events for each 100 second. Right? In this case, we are taking two more samples of uh, 100 second each. Right? And then you can obviously look at those values divided by 100 to get per second values if you want to. Okay, so let's now look at the uh, general options. Max connections, that is something you 
uh, often need to check, right? By default, MySQL comes with typically something like 100 connections allowed, which is, well, may not be uh, enough. How to tune that variable? Well, you should look at max used connections. This is the number of connections which MySQL maximum had uh, since start. Typically, I would look to have max used connections no more than 75% of your max connections, right? So you have some slack out there. Now, note though, you shouldn't be just raising max connections more and more and more, right, to, to tens of thousands. In many cases, if you are using too many connections, the answer is not to increase number of connections, but go back to your application and configure that to use less connections. For example, reducing number of Apache children, reducing your uh, size of a JDBC connection pool and things like that. Thread cache. So what thread cache is, uh, is their structure in MySQL to prevent creating all threads, right, because on each connection. Why? Well, because creating threads is an expensive uh, uh, operation. Especially it was a few years back with uh, uh, Linux threads. Uh, and typically, you would want to tune this variable so there are no more than a couple of threads being created every single, uh, every second. Right? I would say 50 to 100 is typically good default value for most applications, but sometimes you want to go uh, higher. Now, the next ones is table cache and table open cache. These are kind of uh, twin brothers, but with one very important difference. Table cache, uh, oh no, the table cache, sorry, table open cache, that's actually a synonym. I'm speaking about something else. So what this cache contains is, it's a cache of open table instances. What does instances mean? Well, that means what if you have uh, two queries going in parallel, which operate with, with single table, right, then we will have two instances of the same table, and each of them will need an entry in table cache, right? So you would need to uh, watch open table status variable to see how many misses you have. And, and assuming you don't have a lot of tables being created and dropped all the time, you don't want more than a handful of table cache misses per second, right? That uh, 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 should be a goal. If you want to start with something, I think values like about 4,000 is a decent start for uh, many workloads. Related to value is open files limit. How do are they related? For my sum tables, and only for my sum tables, uh, uh, the table cache entry w would require file descriptors. Right? It will be uh, up to two descriptors per table. Or actually more if that's a merge my sum table, right? Then it can be up to two file descriptors for each uh, underlying uh, merge table. So what you want to typically do is you want to boost open file limits to some high value. For more than operating systems, you can essentially get as many open files as you need. That's uh, it's not practical to try to limit your database servers uh, this way. Table definition cache, this is an item which is very uh, related to the table open cache, but it contains information not about the instances of a table, but of the tables themselves. Right? So it contains something like what you will get if show create table statement. The list of fields right, in the table and other information. Now table definition cache has appropriate status variables called open table definition, right? which will be increased uh, appropriately when table definition is open. I uh, try to set table definition cache large enough to cover all tables I have in database. Typically just uh, easy enough to do and it won't take a lot of memory unless you have uh, millions and millions of uh, tables in your, uh, in your database, right? So unless you have over than maybe uh, 100k tables, in the instance, just set it large enough so it covers everything. By the way, let's, che let's check on this uh, item. Now, 
We'll try to find who here has the most amount of tables in MySQL instance. Anybody has more than a thousand? No? Nobody more than a thousand tables in the MySQL instance? Oh my gosh. Okay, well. We're just Okay, okay. So, <laughs> what uh, I can tell you then what I've seen, right? Some people become uh, creative enough or mad enough, as, as we probably know, there's like not much difference between those two. What they get to 10 million or more tables per MySQL instance, right? And that is the case where a lot of things which are expected to work in more kind of normal environment may start to break, right? And that is in this case you want to have a lot more, a lot smaller table open cache than 10 million of this, right? Otherwise you just waste too much memory. Okay, backlog. That is uh, the variable which doesn't uh, need adjustment unless you have a, a very high number of connections per second. I would say if you're getting more than uh, 10, 000, uh, more than a, a thousand of connections per second, not queries per second, but, but connections, right? That's an important difference. Then you don't need to change this. If you have, you may boost it to something like uh, 2,000 or, or something like that. What backlog is, that is essentially depth of a listen queue, right? Which is passed to the listen call when MySQL starts to wait for incoming connections if you want technical details. Max load packet, that is another imp uh, rather important variable. What that defines essentially is the maximum size of a query. The default is one meg, but if I want to uh, run some bulk ins uh, insert statements or insert some large blobs, I may need larger values for that, right? I would be careful. You probably don't want to get uh, queries which have like a gigabyte in size in MySQL. That would be very. Uh, very slow, so I would limit that to 16 megs, maybe 64 megs, right, to keep the development team in change for, in check from doing something very stupid. But you should also should note what this variable defines some internal limits, such as a string limit, right, the, or size of the variables which are used in things like store procedure and, and what's not. So if you set this mm, uh, variable way too high then certain application developer mistakes, they can essentially well, push MySQL to run out of memory, so be careful with that. Another and a related variable is called max connect errors. And this is a very uh, rather important variable to say, I would say, uh, set, especially these days when uh, a lot of people are running MySQL in the cloud. What does this variable do? Well, this variable serves or designed to serve as a protection from a brute force attack on your password. If you have more than 10 by default, right, connection attempt with your own passwords, then the host this connection originates from gets blocked, right, and nobody can connect from that until you run flash host or restart MySQL. Now, what is the problem with this? Well, the problem with this is what if you have any number of network errors, then those aborted connections often would be also counted ag across these limits, right? And then things like the cloud, where we are not con completely con uh, in control of our infrastructure, that may happen every so often, right? And in many cases, people will say, oh my gosh, my MySQL just stopped accepting connections with a stupid error message for whatever reason, right? And that obviously happens at 3 o'clock in the morning, right, or some other very sensible time. Because that is exactly the time the data center did some network maintenance which caused the problem in the first place, right? So I would suggest instead to set that to significantly high value, you know, million, 10 million or something, and use strong passwords. You know, any meaningfully strong passwords can handle brute force attack with, you know, even a billion size dictionary, right, seriously, so. Strong password is the answer. Skip name resolve. That is another uh, network related uh, variable. What it does is it instructs MySQL to avoid DNS lookups on uh, connection attempts. This gives us faster connections 
and safer. What I mean by the safer is what you are not going to depend on your DNS and especially reverse DNS infrastructure. And I would say two very simple things about this. First of all, everybody, like almost everybody believes their DNS infrastructure is bulletproof because they never had any problems with that. And the second thing is that lots and lots of people really have problems originate from the, the DNS problems. Right? Because, well, MySQL can be doing just tons of DNS lookups in, uh, in some cases. So, unless you really need to grant permissions with the names in the hosts, I would uh, use that uh, skip name resolve. Finally, old passwords. Right? Old passwords will use pre-MySQL 4.1, so that's a very, very, very old password hash which was extremely insecure, right? So if somebody would get your encrypted passwords from MySQL 4.0 or below, they could mm, the, find out a password to match those hashes in a fraction, right? A, a fraction of a second, it's, it was so much insecure. Okay, let me st uh, uh, speed up. Other options, Logbin, used for replication, but also is used for point-in-time recovery, right? If you want to, have, even if you don't use replication, but you want to be able to have meaningful backups, where you can actually recover to the current point in time, not just last Saturday, then you need to have log bin enabled, right? Sync bin log, that makes bin log durable. What I mean is what every transaction that it commits is going to be reflected in the, in the bin log. By default, in a DB transaction log will be flashed, right? So it's persistent in a DB, but writes to a binary log are buffered, so you may lose the data in a binary log. Right? So note though, it can cause significant uh, performance penalty if you enable this option. Expire log days, this is an option used for purging binary logs. It's often a very good option, especially enabled with some, uh, with, with some binary log uh, backup process, because it helps you to protect from unlimited space use, right? Typically, I would set something at two weeks or maybe a month, month worth of binary log on the database host itself. Typically, it's good enough for most cases, and then I will keep compressed, archived binary log copies for uh, a longer period of time. TMP table size and max key table size typically are set to uh, same value, which is workload based, which are responsible for, uh, which limit the size of temporary table, in memory temporary table that MySQL can use. Now, what is very imp uh, important to uh, know here is what MySQL does has is create TMP disk table variables. And you can look at that to see how many tables MySQL had to create on disk. What is important to know that is it's not only uh, not enough memory what can cause that. In many cases it simply has to do that because temporary tables have to contain blob or text fields. If you have any of those, then MySQL cannot use in-memory tables. It has to use temporary MySum tables on disk. Right? So you don't just blindly get them to larger and larger values trying to get this, uh, get this down. Size may not have uh, anything to do with that. Query cache size, we spoke about that. Be very more careful. Don't set it to very high values. And I would re re recommend actually to validate and then you have to enable that. So if you and want to enable query cache, try it, but make sure that it does really provides a performance improvement for your application, not just enable that without testing, assuming it will do. Sort buffer size, that's in buffer memory, which is used for uh, sorting data. Uh, in this case, you can watch uh, sort merge passes. We're able to see wherever uh, that buffer was enough or wherever it had to go to disk. What I would worry, though, is what very high values make small sort queries slower. So if you have majority of a small queries, keep small sort buffer size. But for large, let's say, reporting queries, you can set it as a session variable just for that 
uh, session or even just before that be query, right, to use larger sort buffer. That will be the most performance advantages. Joint buffer size, it helps performance of joints with no indexes. But you know what about the joints with no indexes? Huh? Anybody? You don't want to have them. Joints without indexes are bad, right? So, I mean, typically I wouldn't do anything with this variable, but rather fix the queries. If you have some very nasty code which you have no control over, you may uh, need to do something with this variable. Though. A read RND buffer. This is also a buffer which is used is in conjunction with a, uh, a file sort for reading the data. Many people kind of mix a little bit with read buffer size and read RND buffer size very differently. And even though I would uh, read read buffer size and default in most cases, read RND buffer often makes sense to increase to something like 16 megs or so. What is important about this is that the MySQL is often smart enough not to allocate more memory than needed. TMPDIR, that is a variable where MySQL creates various tem temporary files. The most important are sort files and temporary tables, right? In most cases, unless you happen to have some very huge uh, uh, needs for, tem uh, st uh, for temporary storage, I try to use TMPFS for that. Why? Well, because uh, that allows me, in most cases, to use memory for temporary files and only go to uh, swap space if uh, I uh, start to consume too much memory. Like, often on many Linux systems you can just use ready uh, to make this kind of shared memory uh, space which is already created mountain for you. My some options. Key buffer size. This is a cache for my some tables. Anybody here still using my some tables? Anybody, come on, don't be shy. That's okay, that's okay if you are just laggards in this you know, technology use curve. Well, for those who still use MySum, that is an important buffer. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it caches MySQL. Uh, it is a cache which caches MySum indexes, and indexes only, right? It doesn't cache the data for MySum tables. If you're using only my sum tables, you may want to set it up to something like 30% of memory. If not, if you use my sum and in the DB as a mix or something, you typically want to set it to a lot smaller spaces, uh, sizes. I often set it to something like 64 megs to make sure there is enough space for my temporary tables if I need it. My sum recover. That is something which uh, is enabled to automatically check and repair corrupted uh, MySum tables. Very, very nice options, right? Because you don't really want to uh, run with corrupted MySum tables after crash because the result can be quite un uh, unpredictable. But at the same time, you have to be careful because there are practical limits, right? If I have hundreds of gigabytes with you know, many, many tables in MySum, if I start my school with this option, I will probably have it trying to check and repair tens of tables at the same time, which will be very, very slow. So if I'm running the instance with a large amount of my sum, I would rather have some custom start scripts which would sort of check and repair all the my sum tables before getting my school online, right? Maybe something like start with skip network and run the check and then start it back uh, on with a normal port. And the MySum sort buffer size, this is the buffer which MySum will use for check, repair, and optimize table. You can set that up to uh, uh, a few gigabytes in size uh, if you have to. Another important option is low priority updates. This helps making MySum tables a little bit more concurrent. You can't really uh, do anything about the MySQL having a table level locks. But if you have low priority updates, then single waiting update won't prevent all other selects from starting uh, to run, right? So that's an, uh, a good, uh, good variable to, uh, to work with. And bulk insert buffer size is something you may increase if you have a very large bulk insert statements for MySum tables. But it, it only helps with this kind of statements. Okay, in a DB. 
With NADV, there is uh, significantly more tuning variables, but you uh, may not uh, need to change many of them either. The most important one is the energy buffer pool size. And this is essentially what you buy your server memory for if you're running NADB, right? You get another 16 gigs of memory, well, that's where you essentially will spend them to have larger energy buffer pool size. It's extremely important for, uh, for performance. Typically, we'll use something like 80% of memory, sometimes for dedicated MySQL instance, sometimes on large memory size, we can go even further. Energy buffer pool instances that helps us to reduce contention, and you want to set that uh, to four or more. That's a uh, new version, new variable in MySQL 5.5. Energy log buffer size. This is a uh, buffer for writing to the log file. Uh, the values between four and 128 megs uh, make sense, and. Um, and what is important here to note, it's not on, uh, only depends on the amount uh, helps with avoiding the excessive kind of writes, log flashes, but it also internally helps with contentions. When they're going over 16 megs, typically that is not the cause of flashes, but to, uh, to help with contention. In a DB iBoof max size, this is their uh, uh, size which uh, limits the size of the insert buffer in, in a DB. This is a buffer which helps you with inserts, updates and deletes for very large tables on conventional hard drives, right, which have a lot of, uh, to, uh, helps to reduce the seeks. Now, if you're running SSDs, often you would want to reduce that memory. Because for SSDs, it makes more sense to use buffer, uh, buffer pool for caches, right, rather than for insert buffer. And the insert buffer is allocated out of energy buffer pool size, right? It's not a separate buffer. Okay. Another important values. Flash logs at TRX commit, that is variables which helps us with uh, uh, durability. The variable one means fully durable, variable two and zero means not so durable. Typically, value two is the best option which kind of offers us a compromise between performance and uh, durability. Energy flash method defines how energy does IO. In majority of the cases, uh, at this, especially at this point of MySQL 5.5, you set that to O direct. Right, that helps you with uh, performance over long run and has some other benefits. In a DB after LRU dump, this is actually the Percona server, our uh, variant of MySQL feature, which helps to warm up quickly. Right? You may uh, know it if you operate MySQL on the very large memory sizes when, when you restart it and the buffer pool content is lost, it may take it a lot of time to get to a decent performance. That option allows you to reduce that time dramatically. Yep. And in a DB IO capacity is a variable which tunes how much IO in a DB should expect from your hard drives, right? So you should set that up to approximate value of how many IOs your IO subsystem can handle. Read IO and variety of threads, variable which specifies number of threads to MySQL should you use for your IO. I would say in the newer versions of MySQL 5.5, you want just to leave them alone because it uses asynchronous IO anyway, so default number of threads is typically just fine. In the GV flash neighbor pages, that is an interesting variable uh, specifies how NDV optimizes IO. What well, is the most important thing to know about that is if you use an SSD, set that to, uh, to zero because there is no point of trying to merge requests together as there is no six for solid state storage. Log file size, this is the size of redo log file. You want that to be uh, rather large, right? The larger you get it, the better write performance your database will be able to handle, but the longer your recovery time will take if you have a crash. So that is something you have uh, want to balance, and in many cases, simply check, right, by seeing how long MySQL will recover. Log files and group, I will leave with default. Oh, and then energy file per table. This is an, yeah. I wanted to uh, ask you about the interaction between log file size and the files and groups. Is there any advantage to large uh, log files but only two of them, as opposed to, uh, say, 10 files but 
No, I mean, uh, the, essentially there is like, there is no difference. Modern file systems deal with uh, large files pretty reasonably. I typically just leave it to log files, which is default, and just work with a log file size. When, you, when your database is under a high load for a short period of time, the log files get full, mm -hmm. uh, MySQL has to basically stop everything until it can one of those log files, right? Well, uh, yeah. But the thing here is the log files internally are concatenated anyway, right? So that doesn't have anything to do with that problem. Right, so flashes have to happen in the table spaces, right? Not to the log files. So when a flash happens is when uh, you have to do flashes from buffer pool to the data files. Okay. Now, energy file per table, that is also a pretty good option to have which helps us to, you, uh, to keep MySQL uh, in each table uh, in, uh, in its own file instead of just one guy in shared table space. And in most cases, that is a very good, uh, mm, good thing to do. Right? Unless you again have very large amount of tables. If you have over 50,000 tables, I will think about that. In other case, I would just use file per table. Energy file data file path defines where table, uh, main table space is going to be uh, to be located. Typically, you just leave that uh, at default. Uh, energy bill uh, quay timeout is also something you typically would like to wait to for default. Sometimes you want to reduce it to smaller numbers for interactive applications where you don't want to have too long waits for rows when they cannot be locked, right, for whatever reason. In the DBO blocks time, right, that is an interesting variable which uh, few people know about, but that can really help a lot into effective cache usage, especially if you have some bulky queries like bad jobs which otherwise would wash away buffer pool, right? So setting that to something like a thousand is very good, mm, uh, uh, good value. In a D file format, variable defines which format is to use. Antelope it default, or you can uh, often want to set it to Barracuda, which allows you to use some advanced in a DB features such as compression. Right? That is typically why people change it to, uh, to Barracuda and file per table. In a DB stats on metadata, that is uh, also an important uh, variable to deal with, which few people know about. Did you ever experience slowness with working with information schema in MySQL? Anybody? Well, if you have, that is, uh, setting this variable to zero, that probably will, uh, will help you to speed up a lot with essentially no bad side effects. Some visibility options. I would say log slow queries and slow query time. That is your uh, biggest friends, I think working with a uh, uh, slow query log, right, performance size is the most powerful MySQL features. Okay, yeah, and I'm getting some reminders from my back, but I better speed up and get out, right? Okay, so I will still answer your questions, but probably uh, outside if you want to catch me. Another uh, important variable that you want to check on is the user start running. This variable allows you to, uh, which is available in Percona server, allows you to track which tables and indexes are actively accessed. That is a very, uh, uh, very helpful to understand your workload of MySQL. Okay, uh, right on time with my summary. That's my email. If you want to have some follow-up questions being sent, yes, uh, as somebody mentioned before, we are uh, hiring if you are good with MySQL. And I also wanted to note we are uh, running a MySQL conference later this year in New York. And we would love to uh, see you there if you want to le uh, learn more about MySQL. Thank you. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. 
the, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. 
this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in DGM's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.